chapter 16, Revelation chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth, and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. Third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are just, O holy one, who are and were, for you have judged these things, because they shed the blood of saints and prophets, you had given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, O Lord God Almighty, your judgments are true and just. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God, who had authority over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of the pains and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up in order to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw three foul spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophet. These are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. See, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed, not going about naked and exposed to shame. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a violent earthquake, such as had not occurred since people were upon the earth. So violent was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. God remembered great Babylon and gave her the wine cup of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And huge hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds, dropped from heaven on people until they cursed God for the plague of the hail. So fearful was that plague. Charming. Yeah. Right? Okay, so... Now this vision is turning more toward the real last day instead of, okay, this is what it looks like. All these previous visions were, okay, here's what life is like on earth from the ascension of Christ until his return. This is what it's going to be like. Now this is getting into, this is what it's going to be like at the end. It's not so much a vision of what's going on, but what uh, what's going to happen as we get closer to the end, but not quite. It's We'll see as we go through. So the severity of God's judgments, as we see, will increase at the end of the world as Christ's return draws nearer. So um, this is the overall emphasis of this third uh, vision of earthly events. So some of the events we see in it repeat those in the second vision, but in the third vision, they're intensified. Remember I said that's the way John writes. He goes through cycles. So every time he goes through a cycle, it gets more intense. So this time it's getting more intense still. This time it is in order to portray God's final warning, right? So the seriousness of his judgment at the end. Uh, for example, in uh, chapter 8, verses 8 from 9, 8 and 9, one-third of the sea was contaminated, right? And one-third of ocean life perished. But the corresponding plague in 16, verse 3, all the seawater becomes blood, and all the sea creatures will perish. Uh, so the plagues of God's wrath in the third, third vision urge the human race to repent. That's the reason for us knowing about this, is to urge us to repent because it will come a point when it's too late. No one will escape that final judgment. And that's what this vision is pushing us to understand. And it is also a vision of the end. You know, this, this is what's going to happen, and there's not going to be time for anybody to go, oh, I guess I should have believed in God more. It's going to be too late. It's waiting that long. You know, to let, to still let him. Uh, I mean, guys got God's got infinite patience. Yeah, I really. I mean, and thank God, too. Yeah. Because we all need it. We need it sometimes. Okay, so verse one: a great voice from the temple. Right, a loud voice from the temple. What does the Greek say? Yes, a 
megalus phonies, phonies, megalus phonies. So loud, loud voice, and that's literally where we get megaphone. Right? All right, yeah. right. Mega means huge, and then phonies voice, so megaphone, a big voice maker. Right. Greek is fun. All right, so great voice from the temple. Since it's coming from the temple, it's the voice of God Himself, and specifically, it's the voice of Christ second person of the Trinity. So as we are reminded throughout this book of Revelation, it is Christ, the one who alone can break the seals, the one who is in charge of all these events that unfold on earth until his glorious return. And then we have verses two through four. So we have the first angel and he, we have harmful and painful. So the first angel poured his bowl on the earth and foul and painful sores came on those who had the mark of the beast. Okay, so reminiscent of the plague, uh, plague of boils and blisters from Egypt, right? Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 to 12. But the boils were only for a short period of time, right? But the harmful and painful boils from this first bowl of God's wrath will strike humanity all through the New Testament era. So again, this is one of those. It doesn't, it's not just, oh, at the end, these sores are going to come. no. These, this, this idea of the painful sores is something that will strike humanity uh, throughout the New Testament era. So it is, if you, uh, let see if I can say this. Um, yeah, we're not to take this verse literally. So it's not like, oh, at the end of time, this bowl is going to get poured out and all the people are going to get sores. That's literally what's going to happen. No, no. Uh, like many, and like most of the stuff in Revelation, it is picture language to t try to tell us something. And again, John's communicating in code, remember he's in prison, he's sneaking this stuff out of prison to his people, and he is recording the visions he sees, and these visions he sees are through the lens of Old Testament images. So again, the plagues, right? right? So not, we don't take it literally as though the whole human race is going to get struck down with, with literal hum harmful and harmful and painful source, right? But humanity will be afflicted physically by God's wrath in many and various ways throughout history, and that those afflictions will be intensified as the day of judgment grows closer. So did I just say God is going to punish us? Because it sounded that way, right? Mm -hmm. It sounds like I just yeah. said God's going to punish us. Well, God is going to, we are going to be afflicted, afflicted physically by, you know, like the next Adolf Hitler that shows up or the next... Um, pandemic that comes down or the plague comes back. You know, we're going to be afflicted by those things. Well, why is that part of God's wrath? Well, because we sinned, and that's the consequence of sin, is the world is broken. So it has disease, it has warlords, it has all this bad stuff that we've created. So, yeah, it's because of God's wrath, because the, the consequence of sin is all this stuff in the world that we've caused so it doesn't mean God caused it, but he is allowing right. it. But it's like, well, this is the concept. This is God's design. You broke the world, and this is the way the world is. Does it really wrath when these things that are happening are consequences of what we did? Um, in a way, because we're the ones, because of what we did, it allows that wrath. It, it makes a need for the wrath. You know, if we hadn't done anything, then there would be no need for wrath. So, yeah, it's our fault. So is it God's wrath? I mean... Like, okay, say something current day, COVID. <laughs> like, I don't think God sent us COVID. I think we did that ourselves. And then you listen to some of the nincompoops on the internet, and they say, absolutely, God said, well, God is punishing us. Well, so it's not, it's not literal punishment by God, per se. It is, well, this is, this is how God designed the consequences of sin to be, that disease happens, that war happens, that tyranny happens, that poverty happens. Death. Um, so this is this is his wrath is that you broke the world so now you have to live with the consequences um, so it's his wrath like since we created you know I believe that COVID man created mm -hmm. so is God's wrath meaning okay y'all did this to yourself I'm just not going to wave my magic wand and fix it and yeah he, he doesn't push. really wave his magic wand to fix anything right. nowadays so, so is that his wrath is he's letting us go through this because when I think of wrath, I think of something God did. Yeah, well, we think of wrath as punishment. 
Kind of. And it's not. Wrath is... Uh, is wrath, like, okay, my wrath if... Okay, you're going to feel my wrath. So, you know, you stayed out all night. I told you to be home by midnight and you weren't. And then you didn't call and you had your mother worried to death. So my wrath is you were punished for, ne for the next 60 days. You can't, you can't go anywhere with your friends. Right. That's my wrath. Is that punishment? No, it's consequence. Isn't um, it kind of both? It's, yeah, because we're people, because we think of it that way. You know, God's wrath, is it punishment? For specific sins, no. Is it a general, I'm going to allow the world to be like this because of sin? That's when Israel was... I mean, if I sound like I'm weaseling, it's because I'm weaseling. Yeah. Uh, wrath isn't necessarily... That cut and dried. That cut and dried. Okay. You know, it's his, his wrath is, well, here is, here's what you made the world. Now you, you made your bed, now you got to lie in it. That's, my, that's God's wrath. Two degree. Okay. When Moses, uh, you know, when, with the Egyptians, you know, when when those uh, signs, those, um, you know, those plagues that were, those were like a sign to say, you know, either repent or this is hmm? what you get. So either change and then they, so is is this the same or what you're saying? Yeah, because everything that happens in the world like that is an opportunity for us to return in repentance. Right. You know, so so again, God doesn't necessarily send the plague, but he can use the plague to turn sinners to repentance, which is all he actually wants. He wants he wants sinners to turn in repentance and believe. That's what he wants everybody to do. Um, now, in days of old, he actually sent the plague. Yeah. You know, nowadays, it's... A consequence of your actions. I mean, yeah, God is going to allow these things to take place uh, for a reason. We don't always know the reason, but often the reason when bad things happen is it's an opportunity for us to remember who we're supposed to put our faith in and trust in. But most people don't. Most people just blame God. Yeah, which is what exactly what the text says Whatever, in this section. Whatever. Right? Instead of saying, "Yeah, we did this." Yeah, when we get to the when we get to the end of this chapter, you'll see the people say exactly that, and it says, "How many times does it say?" And the people did not repent. And the people did not repent. And the people did not repent. And, and just like Pharaoh, and Pharaoh didn't let them go, and he didn't let them go, and he didn't let them go. And he goes, "Oh yeah, now." Uh, and yeah. he used them even a couple of times. Like he did say, "Okay, I'll do that," and then then he went right back again, yeah. and then. You know, and then he killed his son, and he goes, okay, go. And they still went after him to try to catch him again. It's like he still didn't mm -hmm. let it go, you know? So, yeah, I think I have successfully evaded answering the question, the wrath question, completely. Um, we're going to talk more about wrath, so let me see. Let me see if I wrote something down that's um, remarkable. Because the idea that God's wrath is a hard thing to talk about because it's not just punishment. Because, that, but, you did kind of answer it. Yeah, I mean, it is, isn't just punishment, but it is also, you know, it's allowing you to... Well, it's like if you, if you saw I was going to... If I was going to... You know, if you, if you saw I was going to fail, why didn't you stop me and help me? It's like, well, because you need to learn. You know, and that's what a parent does, right? Sometimes we let your kids kind of know this is like, oh yeah, you gotta you gotta fail. You know, it's like I knew you were gonna overdraw your account and now you gotta pay the consequences. You gotta pay the fine. I'm not doing it for you. But you knew I was gonna do that. Why would you let me do that? Because you have to learn. Right? So it's right. in a way that's what it is. So is it punishment per se sometimes? That's more love. It, yeah it is. All this is out of love. All these plagues are out of love. God loves us so he's gonna send pestilence and disease in Revelation. It, he does all of this for the end. He wants all people to come to faith. That's all he wants. That's all he's ever wanted. Everybody to come to faith uh, and believe and repent. And Yep. But his ways are not our ways. We see the stuff and go, well, why did God allow this, right? Right? We try to use it to our advantage, yeah. I think I just had my own little revelation. Did you? I mean, God does this stuff to make us do that. And we look at that and go, this sucks. Why are you doing that? I don't like, I don't like you. <laughs> right? No. Hmm. Okay, 
because his ways aren't our ways. Sometimes we have to hear that a thousand times and some days it clicks and you go, oh, I get it. And then like a month from now we'll forget <laughs> and it'll be back to why is it like this? Not necessarily. Some of us learn. Yeah, just human nature in general. That's why we have to repeat it. I mean, that's why we have to hear the gospel every Sunday. Have we ever forgotten that Jesus died for our sins so that we can be forgiven and have everlasting life? No, we never forget that. Stop hearing the gospel for a year or two and see if you remember it. Because our nature is to just, eh, whatever. Not even think about it. Out of sight, out of mind. Right. Okay, so then you have the second angel, the second bowl. Uh, yeah, so the, literally, we're not going to be literally struck down with harmful and painful sores, but we will be affected physically by God's wrath in different ways throughout history, and they will intensify as Judgment Day draws forward. So then you have your second angel, poured his blow into the sea, bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. Okay, so however this plague is going to be fulfilled, right? One thing is certainly, and that is increasingly the seas, the bodies of salt water will be made unfit for people or beasts, and that some of the basic requirements for sustaining human food and the cycle by which ocean water evaporates and then provides rainwater to water the earth will in many and various ways throughout history fail. So did I just describe like global warming and you know the demise of the fisheries and stuff? Yeah, I did. <laughs> That's exactly what this verse is talking about. It's like, oh, it must be the end because we're seeing that now. We have seen that throughout human history. Is it accelerating? Yeah, it is. Okay, yeah, we, we're increasingly destroying the oceans. But there's more of us to do so. Yes, there is. Uh, but that will increase. Right. As it accelerates toward the end. So is it the end? No, maybe. Beginning we don't know. Is it the beginning of the end? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, we're not lucky but enough for every genera <laughs> But every generation has said that. Yeah. You know, it's a, in another 40 years, we will not have enough food on earth to sustain life. They've said that before. I mean, you know, like, you look back at history and just go, wow, these people had no idea what was coming. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. It's interesting, though, to see, you know, like when all the ships were docked and nobody was unloading, and then you saw, you know, people were so shocked when they started seeing empty grocery store shelves. It's like it never even clicked in their head. They just thought you know, yeah. things magically yep. appeared. In your a, oh, well, if you don't have any on the shelf, you just go in the back and get more. Like, and then the, and, fish, and, and the stuff that the fishermen caught died, right. and they didn't. Spoiled. They never saw this domino effect. It's like what world yeah, people have you been think, living in. People think their grocery store shelves were replenished by the room of requirement from Harry Potter. It's just whatever I need, I open yeah. this door and it's there. Yeah. And it's like, it's no. like a vegetarian thing. Oh, I and that's, don't kill and that's animals Ameri and eat them. I get my food from you know yeah. the, the, the meat at the grocery store. Yeah, but you see, that's America too. Where do you that's that's, a, it? that's America. And that's what Americans don't get. It's like the people in Eastern Europe are just like, yeah, so that's like what we call Tuesday. What are you talking about? It's like you've never seen an empty store shelf before. Well, you know, the milk and the eggs and the stuff are gone, but there's going to be a storm. Yeah, because people are dumb. But, like, yeah, people in this country have no idea what it actually means to go to bed hungry. I mean, some do. Some do. Right, take, right. Let me I, temper I that statement. That. But for generally, as a right. people, America... Yeah, we got it pretty good compared to the rest of the world. Spoiled. We are yeah. pretty spoiled. And that's why I can't stand, and I know I've said it myself, but, you know, when somebody says, yeah, when do we eat? I'm starving. And I hate that. It's like, right. no, you can't use that you're word not. Starving. You actually have no concept of what starving is. Right. Neither do I. Right. But I know I, what it is to be hungry, but I don't know yeah. what it means to be starving. I don't know what it is to look in the mirror and see myself wasting away because I don't have enough food to eat. I actually go on a little bit of a tangent when people bring that stuff up. And say like, don't don't things. say I'm you're like, starving. You know, you? My mother even said because uh, she was she has a new phone and she's having problems with it and you know she's seventy six now and things are just you know her mind and but she's like it's so much harder to be elderly these days and it used I'm like mom are you kidding me we are the most 
spoiled in every generation as it easier. Yeah, because that's why you guys are living so much longer, because it's so hard. Yeah, I'm like... So, you don't yeah. die when you're 40 anymore. Right? Yeah, I, I just couldn't understand how she can say that and believe it. My father used to correct me. He'd be like, no, you're not starving, you're hungry. Yeah. That's you there's a difference. Yeah. You want to know what starving is? I'll show you what starving <laughs> is. Get in the basement. <laughs> For all those living at home, do not ever put anybody in the basement and not give them food. Oh, but you do put people in the basement? Could you stop? There's got to be one in every crowd. Yes, there does. Okay, so the third angel, third bowl, we have the river and springs of water, the fresh water this time, uh, become blood. So not like when we saw it before, where a third of the rivers yeah. started to become, which if you look around the world today, about a third of the water is no good, right? Uh, but this one, the third bowl, third angel, third bowl, the rivers, all the rivers and springs of water become blood. So not only will the seas be plagued throughout history in many and various ways, but also the fresh water supply will be plagued. The point is clear in both plagues that affect humanity's water supply, namely that God's wrath will strike them in such a way that they will sometimes harm rather than sustain human life. And toward the end, it sounds like they will all go bad. All of it. I have a silly question. Sure. I'm not trying to be difficult. But like a couple chapters ago when the blood was you know, going through the streets, mm -hmm. and it was completely covering and deep and everything, mm -hmm. like how long a period does this take space over? Different vision. Okay, so remember, you have all these visions in John. So you like this vision, you know, like so you can say, okay, here's the story of the seven seals, the end. And then here's so think of Revelation not as a book, but like a chap, like a, a collection of short stories. So each one of these short stories is telling us about what it looks like in a sinful but, world, but not in sequence. But not in sequence. That's how everybody in your generic American evangelicalism gets in trouble with this book because they s tried to read it serially. And they're like, okay, at this point, you know, when we see the horror of Babylon, we know the end is coming. And then, you know, that's when the rapture is going to happen because you get all this stuff that when you try to read it like a linear story, you can't, you can't do that. So you have, you can't sense. control it. So it's not usually my rule of thumb is that when you hear thunder, lightning, earthquake, the world just ended, start over. And whatever comes next, you start over. So, like, we're going to hear at the end of this, there's thunder, lightning, and a great earthquake, and that's the end. That's the end of it. And then you move on. Uh, Are we going to hear trumpets first? We did the trumpet angels. That was the last vision. The last sevenfold vision. But, yeah, there's, there's more. But, yeah, every, so every time you see thunder, lightning, earthquake, uh, peals of lightning, ro roiling thunder, and an earthquake, that's the end of the world. So you, whatever comes next, you start over again. So it's like, here I am in the world today, and, and you read that. Uh, so yeah, when you saw the, the blood, it, this even makes a reference to that wine press of God's wrath. So it's like, well, here's the wine. So that was just a vision of what it's going to be like right at the end. And then in this vision, it's going to say, remember that wine press of God's wrath? Yeah, people are drinking it, see? So it's the end of the world. So they took, they'd incorporates a reference to that vision of the end of the world in this vision of the end of the world. So it's all, it's very self-referential and then it refers to the Old Testament, uh, but it repeats itself over and over and over. There's like, I think there's seven visions total and then three of those seven visions are sevenfold visions, plus all the interludes and stuff. So there's like a lot of stuff repeating itself in the book. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, so like again, if you try to read it in, in any kind of order, yeah, you're gonna get a lot of trouble doing that. Okay, third angel, third we already said that, verse uh, five to seven. Um, and I heard the angel of the waters say, you are just, holy one, who are and were, for you've judged these things because they shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. You've given them blood to drink, it's what they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. All right, the angel of the waters. So we have... An indication that some of God's holy angels have been given specific responsibilities. Um, so we have an angel of the waters, an angel of the land. You have the angel of the four winds, remember? We talked about the angels of the four winds. Are there literally four winds? No. Uh, so you have, you have angels of land, angels of sea, angels of sky, angels of you, angels of me. We each have a guardian angel. Uh, 
is that reaching? Maybe. Maybe, and a lot of interpreters do interpret it that way, that some angels have specific parts of creation they watch over. There's indications of that from Scripture. You know, not specifically, but that they, they watch over the creation, and we are part of the creation. Is it four winds for all directions? Yeah, it just means all directions. Same with the four corners of the earth. Does it mean that the Bible says the earth is flat? It just means all the earth. four compass points. There's four okay. points on the compass. Actually, as any flat earther that are listening out there, earth is round. Ancient Greeks know it thousands and thousands of years ago. The ancient people were a lot smarter than we are with a lot of stuff. Okay, so this angel, this particular angel has overseeing over the uh, oversight over the waters. The angel of the water cries out in worship and praise of God, declaring that his judgments are just. God's holy angels know all the all too well what our sins deserve because they are forever in the presence of the Holy One, the righteous creator, and they know what happens to angels who disobeyed too. So the greatest mystery to them is the fact that God would become man in order to save the human race from what they deserve for their sins. That's probably the greatest mystery the angels have. It's like, why did God choose to do it that way? They don't get it. Uh, they gladly obey God in ministering to his people, those to whom he gives faith, but they also gladly obey God in administering his wrath and judgment. Um, they realize very clearly that when we, what we sinners fail to fully comprehend, namely that God is perfectly righteous and just in both instances. You know, when he is, when he is loving and when he is punishing he is righteous and just at all times. And so when he declares sinners righteous on behalf of his son in whom they believe, when he punishes those who refuse to accept the gift of faith that he desires to give them, both sides of that are equally just. The angels understand this. Now let's see. For they've shed the blood of the saints and prophets while all unbelievers will justly experience God's wrath and judgment. Uh, is specifically those who persecute and kill God's chosen people, which is highlighted here by the angel. Uh, they'll get what's coming to them in the end. God will vindicate his people. He'll take vengeance upon those who have harmed or killed them. And again, God will be perfectly righteous and just in doing so. That's a constant theme throughout this book, that we've seen that God will punish those who afflict his people. It's been highlighted throughout. Uh, want specifics, go back to chapter 6, chapter 8, does that. You had a question? Sure. Okay. Well, let's see. And then I heard the altar saying, uh, back in 6-9, the souls of the martyrs were depicted as being beneath the heavenly altar. Uh, and in Revelation 8, 3 through 5, the prayers of the saints were signified by the rising of incense uh, at the altar. Now the altar itself becomes the personification of the prayerful desire of God's people for vindication of his righteousness. So it's not literally the altar is talking. Okay, So when you see the altar doing something that's symbolic of those saints who are symbolically beneath the altar, uh, it's basically, it's just an allegory for an allusion to this, the martyred saints specifically I'm talking about. So not like when we die, we become saints, you know, fully justified and righteous. Uh, but the ones who were killed for the faith, the actual martyrs, they're the souls that are depicted as being under the altar, and it's their voices that are being heard as the altar speaking. Okay. Uh, and it couldn't be otherwise. You know, it's, oh, it, the altar is testifying to the perfect appropriateness of God's judgment. Again, what this chapter is about, not just about God's judgment, but also about how holy righteous that judgment is. Uh, because the judge is the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, whose divine judgments are true and just. And that's from a fellow named Dr. Lawrence L. White, uh, who wrote the book of Revelation, Scripture's Crescendo and Culmination. Not a book you want to own. <laughs> it's one of those. Uh, but it had some little gems here and there. Is it worse than Katie Rib? Nothing's worse than that, except pay, maybe the musical they made based on her name, her life. It was so bad.
bad, so bad. I don't know. All right, uh, verses 8 to 11. All right, the fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun and was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God who had authority over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So now we're going to see a contrast. You see a shift, a shifting point in the chapter. Now, before we saw how every, the angels and saints are saying how just and righteous God's actions are. No matter what they are, punishment, redemption, they're just. Now you're going to see a shift, and we see that with us. So the fourth angel pours its bowl, and they curse the name of God. The complete opposite. So the angel pours out the fourth bowl, and the sun is allowed to scorch people with fire. Is this talking about global warming? Maybe. Um, it's figurative language. It doesn't literally mean the sun's going to like explode and rain down fireballs on us. Uh, but rather that the sun will be used to cause great pain and discomfort among the people of the earth. So a lot of the modern commentators, how can they not, see the breaking down of the ozone layer, which is in place to protect us from ultraviolet rays of the sun as the fulfillment of this fourth plague. But yeah, the hole's kind of fixed itself now. So. I thought that was the fault of the 80s and the cans of aquanut. I blame it on aquanut. Chlorofluorocarbons. Yeah, chlorofluorocarbons. Yeah. Yep. And now we banned them, and you know, 40 years later, the hole has fixed itself because right. we reasons. Uh, but um, the more the ozone layer breaks down, the more other things in the atmosphere break down, the more harmful the sun rays become uh, to us, signaling that the end is near. But man has been pumping bad stuff into the air since we first made fire. So uh, we can't limit our interpretation to these convenient illusions alone, um, much as we would like. You know, it's just like if that giant Chinese dam breaks and floods, you know, half of China, you know, is that going to be a sign that that's one of the signs in this book? No, probably not. That just means Walmart will go out of business. <laughs> it just means Walmart will go out of business. Okay, so throughout the New Testament era, these things are going to happen. And remember, again, it's got to mean to the people who are reading this in the first and second century, it's got to mean the same thing to them as it does to us. So is it, is it prophecy of disasters to come? Yeah, it is. You know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Maybe we'll get better for a time and then it'll get bad again. That's what people have done to our environment since day one. You know, we screw things up and some of it we fix and some of it we make worse. And some of it, when we try to fix it, go, yeah, we maybe shouldn't have done that because now we have this other problem. All right? That's all these visions about the environment are telling us is that, yeah, until Jesus comes again, yeah, they're just going to continue to be screwed up and it's going to be our fault. Uh, all right, so we also have to recognize that God's allowed in this vision, God has allowed the sun to be this plague. Uh, and Whatever has happened, it's the result of the judgment we're reading about here. So they cursed the name of God, did not repent, and give him glory. The point of all these judgments and all these plagues brought upon the earth by God is to warn people of the judgment, capital J, judgment to come, to call them to repentance and faith. But most people miss that point entirely. When these judgments come upon them, instead of turning to God in repentance and faith, they blaspheme and curse him. And I said, like, well, I'll get you, God, like, like we could ever do that. It's like, well, I'll get you, God, for what you've done to me. Like, How are you going to do that, Good right? Luck Good that. luck with that. Um, either they acknowledge that there is a God and they hate him or her for it, whoever they think God is, for allowing them to suffer, or they attribute their sufferings to random chance or to fate refusing to acknowledge God. Either one, it's just as blasphemous. Basically, it's denying, you know, uh, if God exists, if God does exist, I want nothing to do with him. I won't worship a God who allows all this pain and suffering in the world. I've actually heard people say that. And it's like, it's hard to reason with them. I've heard a lot of people say that. Yeah, so if God exists, I don't want anything to do with him. I will not, I, I want nothing to do with you because you allow it. And it's like, well... He allows all the pain and suffering in the world because he cares about everybody's eternal well-being, which doesn't mean your temporal well-being, by the way. 
temporal, meaning temporary. You know, he uses the pain and suffering to turn us from rebellion, to rescue us from eternal pain and suffering. And his ways are not our ways. It's like, could maybe could you pick a different way that doesn't hurt so much to make me remember you? Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe we would well, it. Actually, it's, isn't he giving you exactly what you want? You know, I mean, a lot of people, mm -hmm. the pain and suffering, a lot of people, it's by their own choices that they're in that position. Well, the pain and suffering we do to ourselves is not necessarily, you know, that's the pain and suffering we do to ourselves, but it's... But the stuff that I'm talking about, you know, it's like, okay, uh, somebody loses their whole family and everything in a fire. And it's like, how's God going to use that to, why did God let that happen to that person? That seems unfair. He was a nice guy. And yet this guy over here, who we know is in the mob, you know, he's mobbed up and he's can't prove it, but he's killed umpteen people. And, you know, and look at the nice house he lives in and uh, yeah. the way they live and nothing ever touches him. How does he get away with it? He's, he's a godless heathen, right? It's not fair. Well, uh, again, God cares about your eternal well-being, your temporal well-being. Mm -hmm. Pray about it. Ask for it. He will answer things, yes or no. Or not yet, or maybe. Um, it's not for us to necessarily understand why they work out the way they do. But all things, all things are to remind us to turn to him in trust and faith. That one day, even these trials and pains will be over. Um, again, temporary. For most people, it's this is all there is. They forget or don't think about eternity or they have no concept of eternity or you know they just don't believe in eternity and they're like, if this is all there is, well then, screw God because my life sucks. And if this is all there is, can you blame them? Because, yeah, that would be kind of, yeah, this is pretty unfair because then, then when life's over, you die and that's it. Well, what's the point? Every man for himself, there should be anarchy. Every man for himself, because that's the only way to get your best life in this world, is to, whoever dies with the most wins, right? Yeah. That philosophy is the way a, a life based on no afterlife would be lived. But that's not the life we live. We believe in an afterlife. We believe that God will rescue us from this, and that everything that is broken because of sin will be fixed. So again, temporary. So in the meantime, in our regularly scheduled program here, you know, this ABC after school special we call life, where things aren't fair and things are hard and they don't just don't get better at the end because we can't fathom his reasons for why. I mean, maybe we have to suffer because somebody six degrees separated from us are going to become to faith because of something we say to somebody, to somebody, to somebody that gets to their ears and they believe. I don't know. It's complicated. It's a dynamic system. You know? We can't fathom it. Okay, the fifth angel which is the throne of the beast. What number are we on? Fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. Sensing a theme now? Yeah, they're down. <laughs> All right, so those who have the mark of the beast upon them refuse a penny. You want to ask them? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Just ask. 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 Sure. Okay. Okay, so those who have the mark of the beast upon them refuse to repent, and God now strikes the beast and its kingdom, which is the object of their worship and allegiance. And his kingdom is plunged into darkness, which is reminiscent of the plague of darkness in Egypt from Exodus 10. But there's a difference between the darkness then and the darkness spoken about here. In Egypt, it was a literal darkness, right? 
you know, God sent the plague of darkness and there was no light, right? Uh, here, we're talking about spiritual darkness, right? So this is not literal darkness, which spiritual darkness symbolizes eternal death, damnation, everlasting separation from the light of Christ. Um, okay, so now let's talk about where's the beast's kingdom? There it is. Okay, look outside. That's the beast king. This is his world. He is called the prince of the, Jesus calls him the prince of this world. This is his. So who has the mark of the beast? Those who refuse to repent. Right? Anybody who has the mark of Christ, which was put on us in our baptisms, right? Yeah, we're, we're okay. We still have to repent for our sins, but, but those who do not believe, those are the ones who have the mark of the beast. That's all that means. It just means unbeliever. All right, so the beast's kingdom is plugged into spiritual darkness. Uh, all right, so in our lives, right, we know who are those who are citizens of the beast kingdom, in other words, unbelievers, will experience spiritual darkness. They lack any peace, hope, and comfort, which comes through faith in Christ. They will find substitutes. Uh, they will try, uh, which are other religions, right? Uh, yoga, I don't know, spiritual discipline. Yoga's just an exercise. Hmm? Yoga's just an exercise. No, it's not. Some people just do that. Yeah, the, it's fine if you do that. I mean, because it's the, the stretchy bits, it's fine. But yoga, rightly whole, understood, is a whole, it is a meditation. whole religious meditation thing. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm not entirely on board with, you know, like the ones they hand out. Well, you shouldn't do yoga because it's a short step there from yoga to the whole mysterious Buddhist philosophy. It's like, go be stretchy. I don't know anybody, I don't know any of these ladies that teach yoga that are Buddhist philosophers or gurus of that nature. They're just, they learn how to do it and they do, I want to open a yoga shop. So they open a yoga shop. <laughs> They're not... I'm not worried about them being false teachers, right? And I've, I've been to a lot of yoga classes in the last 40 years. Not one of them have ever done anything besides stretches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they so, don't do anything else. And if they did, I wouldn't have been there. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, in other words, their lives are in spiritual disarray, whether they like to acknowledge that or not. It's like some... That's the nature of the kingdom of the beast. But the spiritual darkness they experience in this life will be nothing like the actual darkness in the eternity to come. Uh, people gnawed their tongues and cursed God and did not repent. Uh, God's actions here to plunge the kingdom of the beast in the darkness is to awaken those who belong to that kingdom to realize the futility of their allegiance and to turn in repentance and faith to his kingdom of light. So, do they get the message? Some do, most won't. It's pretty much, it tells us most will not turn. Uh, so at this point though, do they still have the choice to repent and come to God? You know, it depends, and I'm, I'm because of the way I teach, most people would take a stand and go either this vision is the end, or it's just another vision of life in this world and ice. I don't know. I think this chapter is a little bit of both. That it's, yeah, you can take it, interpret it as a vision of life in this world until Jesus comes back. And we can also kind of squeeze that timeline and go, this is a vision of what it's going to be like close to the end because of how intense it's getting. Uh, it I may even be intentional on John's part to be that way. So ask your question again because I didn't answer it. Well, when it says they did not repent of their deeds. Yeah, okay, so do they have time? Yeah, they do. I think you have time until Jesus actually goes, and he's here, and you're going to go, now it's too late. <laughs> and you're just going to know. You're going to know it's too late. Because everyone's going to see him, everybody's going to know who that is, and those who believe are like, yay, and everybody else is going to be like, oh, no, no. I guess um, it's hard it's hard to understand that 
you know, if there's even one second that you could still repent and all this crap yes. is happening that you wouldn't. I don't want to. Yeah, and I, I have to, and I have to say, wasn't that human? It's like, well, yeah, I, you need to evacuate. Yeah, I got time. I'll wait. I'll wait till it gets bad, and then I'll evacuate. And then they don't evacuate, and then you're digging their body out with all the wreckage after the storm. And they did it at Pompeii. We have it recorded. Like two days. It's like things. Go, it's like what's the baking soda volcano on the horizon doing? I don't know. Something can't be good. I won't worry about it tomorrow. And then when it really erupted, erupted. Then it was too late. That's I love that example. Is okay. So Pompeii is starting to spit a little bit, and people are going. Some people went. Yeah. Hey, the volcano that's never blown up in living memory looks like it's doing something. We should leave, and people left. And other people are just like, eh. What are you gonna do? And then when the thing blew its top, it blew so violently that people died where they're sitting. And you could see the casts that they took of the ash, where people are just standing, sitting, literally sitting like this. Like it just caught them, and they were buried alive in the ash. That's how fast it happened. So yeah, we see these things happening. It's like it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. The eruption's coming, and then when it comes at the end, it'll be too late. Yeah. Boom! It'll just happen. So yeah, you would think people like how could people see the signs and not say, "I need to repent." I don't know we've been asking that for well, two thousand years now, right? Hey, how could people how could people deny the resurrection and want to, right? And then here comes Nero, and he's persecuting everybody, and he's, you know, he tore down the temple, Nero, or in 70 AD, whoever was the emperor, and then tore down the temple and, you know, spread the Jews throughout the world and, and was killing Christians. And boy, you should think people would repent and believe, because look at this plague upon the earth, right? That's just one more reason why it's so hard to love your neighbor. Yeah. They're freaking stupid. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. So there's the spiritual. There's the spiritual disarray. As like, despite the signs. These aren't signs. These are like bad. Bad stuff's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. This isn't just people talking yeah. or teaching. This is stuff happening. And this is what Scripture is telling us, so we don't get discouraged either. Is hey, the sad fact is most people won't take heed to God's warnings. They will grow more vehement and vehement, vehement, I never know if I say that right, in their hatred and anger toward God. They gnaw their tongues in anguish. But as our Lord tells us, they'll be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So they're like, mm, right now. But they still don't change. It's like they're, they're, gnash, they're chewing their tongue, they're so mad. But they don't repent. That's unfortunate. Okay, then in verse 12 through 16, the sixth angel pours his bowl on the Euphrates to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Okay, so here, like in the sixth trumpet, we are given a picture of the final battle between God's kingdom and the kingdom of the beast, or Satan's kingdom, right? The devil's war against the church continues throughout the entire New Testament era which we see in chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. But it culminates in one last and greatest battle before the end, at Christ's return. Uh, and what is that battle? We're about to see it. So the Euphrates is mentioned again. It was mentioned back in 914. Because it played a significant role in the history of the Israelites and uh, the other nations of the Fertile Crescent there in the Middle East. So... Kings from the east are mentioned because most of Israel's enemies come from the east. Those historically significant things are used to symbolize the last great battle to take place between Satan and the church. The fact that the water of the Euphrates is dried up to allow the kings from the east to enter the battlefield calls to mind the parting of the Red Sea and the splitting of the waters of the Jordan River. So that was Exodus 14 and Joshua 3. In those instances, it was God who parted the waters to allow his people to cross on dry land uh, to escape the pursuit of their Egyptian enemies and then on the end to allow them to enter the promised land to conquer their enemies. Here the drying up of the Euphrates symbolizes the fact that God will allow his enemies who are under control of the beast 
to enter the battlefield for this final conflict with his church. The kings from the east represent all those who worship the beast, all of those who worship his image, uh, and thus pledge their allegiance to the dragon. So in other words, all unbelievers. And so then what do we have? And I saw three foul spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophet. These are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. All right, so here we see before us a picture of that same unholy trinity that we saw earlier, right, in chapters 12 and 13. Um, Satan's attempt to mock the triune God, which everything he does is a mockery of it. Here we see the third person in this unholy trinity is given a new title, right? So we had the beast, yeah, the dragon, the beast from the sea, and the beast from the earth. Well, now the beast from the earth gets a new name. He's not called the beast from the earth. He's called the false prophet. So now it's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, uh, which is what the beast from the land represented, false teachers. So the false prophet is the same figure as the beast from the earth, but this is the person of the unholy trinity who mocks the third person of the most holy trinity, in other words, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always prophesizes about and points people to Christ. He's the true prophet. The beast from the earth prophesies about and points people to the first beast, all right? The second person of the unholy trinity who mocks Christ. So he is the false prophet. Uh, three unclean spirits like frogs. Uh, the unholy trinity is the power and influence behind the kings and their hosts who will enter the battlefield to make war with Christ's church in this vision. They release their demons, symbolized by frogs, to go out and gather the troops for the final battle. Why frogs? Well, because the frogs covered everything in Egypt in the plague, right? Exodus 8. That means that the host gathered by these demons for battle will cover the entire earth. And this is consistent with the teaching throughout Scripture, and especially Revelation, that when the last day arrives, the whole world will be under Satan's influence. Which we don't like to think about that, but that's, yeah there will be a very small remnant of God's people left on earth. The vast majority of people living on earth at that time will have fallen prey to his in, the devil's influence during his little season, and we will have forsaken God and become his enemies. This is what is meant by the demons performing signs. The signs they will perform are spiritual in nature, the greatest of which are those which twist, distort, and replace true Christian doctrine and practice into false doctrine and practice. And you have to keep that in mind throughout reading this book, reading Revelation. The purpose of the unholy trinity is to replace Christ's church with a false church, to deceive people into believing they belong to Christ's church, even though they do not. And if you look at uh, Matthew 7, Matthew 24 talks about that. Um, and then uh, the, a guy that I've read that wrote a pretty good study on Revelation said, as I have noted, so it's Pastor Messer saying this, as I have noted many times throughout this class on the Revelation, it's very possible that we are already in Satan's little season and the last day is drawing near given the fact that there's very little true Christianity left in the world. And the true Christianity, which still does exist, is shrinking day by day, being replaced with all kinds of false religions which merely masquerade as Christianity, end quote. Ah. Uh, no, I think it can get worse. <laughs> I think it can get worse. Um, I mean, granted, okay, the Roman Catholic Church is like half the people in the world, and is that true Christianity? No, it's broken. Uh, does that mean all those Roman Catholics aren't going to happen? No, they are. I mean, just because the church has lost its way, um, that doesn't mean ever, all these Roman Catholics aren't saved. Uh, they have a whole lot of false teaching and a lot of false doctrine that's got to be hopefully one day fixed. But uh, is this the little season? No. There's an awful lot of Christians left on earth. It's going to get bad. And I think we'll know how bad it is. It's going to look like there's every, I, I, and this is my opinion, not interpretation of scripture. This is my opinion. When that day comes, I think every Christian left is going to think he's the only Christian left on earth. That's how bad it's going to be. You know, you're just going to be on an island by yourself. Nobody else in sight going, I think I'm the last one. That's how bad it'll get. 
It ain't that bad yet. That sounds like a lot of fun. That does not sound good How at all. How come we have to go through all this? We're the believers. Why can't we just skip this part? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, battle on the great day of God, the Almighty. The great day of God, because it's the day when God will finally bring an eternal end to the assault on his kingdom. The day of reckoning, the day on which Satan and all his followers will receive their eternal judgment and no longer to be able to do any harm against God's people. And let's see. Uh, see, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and clothed, not going about naked and exposed in shame. Uh, Christ speaks one final warning to everyone before the final battle takes place. Because when it begins, that will bring an end to any chance to turn to him to repentance and faith. So that's a answering your question. Uh, so before this final battle takes place, whatever that actually means, uh, that's the point when it will be the point of no return. Nobody can repent. Uh, so it's a plea to his people, his church, to remain awake and not grow weary lest they fall prey to Satan's influence and find themselves on the wrong side of the battlefield on the last day. And that's the message given throughout Revelation, and in fact, it is the message given throughout Scripture, namely, that God's people are exhorted to remain steadfast in his word. So to stay awake is to remain steadfast in his word in the midst of living in this dead and dying world with all its attempts to lure us away from the truth. Uh, it is to keep our garments on, that is to remain clothed in the righteousness and holiness of Christ in which we were robed at our baptism. How do we do that? By living a life of daily repentance, continuously recognizing, confessing our sinfulness and trusting in our Lord Christ who paid the price for us in full and by continuing to come to the place where Christ meets us with his gifts of word and sacrament to feed us, nourish us, strengthen us uh, in the one true faith. And those who endure to the end, that is those who remain steadfast in the word, are truly blessed and have nothing to fear on the last day. Okay, Armageddon, because it actually has that uh, sound at the beginning of it in the, in the original. I, I've never noticed that before. But there is a hard breathing mark, so it's uh, Armageddon. I've never heard anyone say it's that. It's Armageddon. Uh, so Armageddon literally means the Mount of Megiddo. And Megiddo is an ancient city located in Israel's Jezreel Valley. Do I have a map of that? Do I have a map of that? Good map of Jerusalem, that's what I need. Jerusalem. See, I have great map of Jerusalem. I have great maps of Jerusalem itself. And I have maps of This is one of history's most famous battlefields that you've never heard of. Okay, so there's records of battles taking place there as far at, back as uh, 1468 BC. Uh, Megiddo is mentioned in scripture several times. Uh, Judges 4, 2 Kings 23, 2 Kings 9, uh, Zechariah 12, among others. But this is the first time the mountain of Megiddo is mentioned, which is weird, a little odd because Megiddo is famous not for its mountains, but for its vast expanse of flat land. All right, There's hills surrounding the region, but the battles have always been fought in the huge valley of Megiddo. But since this is not literal but figurative language, the mountain of Megiddo could allude to the fact that the mountains have often witnessed great events in biblical history. Uh, Isaiah 44, Ezekiel 6, Ezekiel 35, Ezekiel 36. So when you put the two together, Megiddo and Mountain, you have the image of a significant battle taking place. And this is all set up language. Um, is, the, is the end, is Armageddon going to take place in this valley at the end? No, probably not. Maybe, but probably not. Uh, but you have 
Megiddo symbolizing battle. That's what this name is supposed to signify. And then you have mountains symbolizing the significance because the mountains witness these great events. Kind of like, oh, when the Ten Commandments were given to us, it was on a mountain. And when Jesus was transfigured, it was on a mountain. Uh, when he was ascended, he was on a hill, you know, right? Okay, so whatever the case, we know with absolute certainty, regardless of what the dispensationalists and so-called prophecy experts claim, Armageddon does not refer to a specific geographical location in which the final battle between the kingdoms of Satan and Christ will take place. Uh, this Armageddon is not used here, as used here not as the designation of a particular geographic place, but as a terrifying metaphor of war that will cover the expanse of the entire earth since the whole human race will be caught up in it. And the enemy's intent in this last battle before the end will be the destruction of the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ. But the enemy shall not prevail, and the kingdom shall belong to the Lord forever and ever. So that's supposed to be helpful, cheerful. Um, you know, so again, you know, there's not, oh, the final battle can't take place. So we have to support Israel because Israel still has to exist before Jesus can come back. No. That's all misinterpretation stuff. Okay. Then verse 17. The seventh angel poured his thing in the air, and the voice came out of the temple for the throne, saying, It's done. All right, the loud voice again from the temple, the voice of God the Father, who exclaims, The end is here, for all things have been done. Reminiscent of Christ's exclamation from the cross, It is finished, indicating that everything necessary to bring about the salvation of mankind was now fully and completely accomplished with his death on the cross. So here God's exclamation refers to the sure and certain fact that everything that needed to happen has been completely accomplished by the end. Uh, so now the end can come. It's like, okay, he's done with time. He's done with history. History's done. Now it can end. That's literally what that means. God's purpose for having time has ended. Uh, which is kind of neat. Kind of scary, kind of neat. All right, so both Christ's exclamation from the cross and the exclamation made here by God the Father, the verb used in the Greek tense is in the perfect tense, uh, which is fun because the perfect tense is significant because the perfect tense indicates completed action with an ongoing result. All right, so Christ's death on the cross brought about the complete fulfillment of our salvation, right? And the results keep coming from the cross. They are eternal. So nothing more could ever be done to add or take away from the salvation he, had, he accomplished on the cross. But, is, but that, when he said it is finished, that being state of being finished has an ongoing result of being finished, if that makes sense. So he said it is finished, and it continues to be finished. It means it's really, really finished, right? You, nothing can be added or taken away from it. It's finished, it's been accomplished, and it will continue to be so forever, right? Same thing here with what the Father's saying. It's in that perfect tense, which means this is the end. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really, this is it. It's done, okay? Um, so nothing more could ever be done to add or take away from all the events that were to take place before the end would come. It's done. God's done everything necessary. He's provided every possible warning that he needed to give. He's issued every call to repentance that was necessary. Nothing's been undone. It's time. Christ can come. Now it's too late. Okay. So now flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake. The first thing that comes to mind is, again, that vision on Mount Sinai, right? Of Exodus 19, they saw the you know Moses. The people were scared to death. They said, "Can Moses go do this for us? We don't want to go up there anymore. We don't want to hear that voice. That's terrifying." All right. So Moses goes to speak to God on their behalf. That same imagery imagery is used here to describe the appearance of God in Christ on the last day. Like the Israelites, most people will be absolutely terrified when that day comes. But unlike the day at Mount Sinai, the physical phenomena mentioned here will be much more severe in scope. Uh, it's going to encompass the whole earth. There have been severe storms with dangerous lightning and loud thunder and large hail. 
and there have been massive earthquakes and destructions of cities throughout history. These things happen, but none of them will compare to what will occur on the last day. The earth will shake like they've never before seen. The last trumpet will blow, announcing the return of Christ. All of these physical phenomena will occur on the last day as necessary, given the fact that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So the old one has to go away first. The whole old universe, the whole creation, has to be unmade so they can be remade. Uh, and then they cursed God for the plague of hail. So the hail, again, is reminiscent of the sixth plague of Egypt from Exodus 9. Uh, but here the hail is huge, like 100-pound hail. That's a big hailstone. And it falls upon the whole earth. Uh, so the image is one of nature gone nuts, right? Raining death, uh, raining destruction upon the world of men. And even at the end, even after those marked by the image of the beast realize that Christ is the Lord of all, they still curse God. They know that judgment has come upon them, and rather than apologizing to God for their stubborn refusal to repent and trust in Christ, not that that would do them any necessarily good at this point, they continue to blaspheme his curse's name, showing their utter hatred and contempt for him and indicating their faithful allegiance to Satan. And that's where it ends, with people being stupid right to the last second. So like I said, cheerful. We're going to see some real weird stuff in the next couple chapters. Uh, but then it gets better. The next couple chapters, we're going to see description, more descriptions of the end. And then the last three, four, is there four? Yeah, four chapters. The last four chapters of Revelation will mostly be about uh, justice. We'll still see some more justice, but then we'll see what it's what the unmaking and remaking of creation is going to be like. Uh, you will see Christ as the great victor uh, in that wonderful image. And uh, that's it. So we've got like seven more chapters again. Which ever is this? 17, 17 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. We have five chapters because I can count. We have five chapters ago. Five chapters ago. Six chapters ago. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, six, six chapters to go. You mean there was holes too? No. Okay. Yeah, six. we're making progress. We're making progress. Yeah, so Ooh, next chapter, on. more joyful imagery. We will see the judgment of the whore of Babylon. Remember, remember, remember the girl that was sitting on the other beast riding on its back? It's her turn next week. So that's where we'll leave it. We'll pick up with chapter 17 next time.